Welcome to day two of RightsCon and in conversation the next 30 minutes with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Nobel Peace Prize winner and journalist from the Philippines, Maria Reza. Now, we're doing this slightly differently uh, in this segment. We are actually partnering with the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Lab, who are having their summit in Brussels. It's called 360 Open Summit, and there is Rose Jackson and Graham Brookie right now. Hi, guys. How are you guys doing? I don't think I can hear you guys on my end. Hello, Rose and Graham. I'm so sorry, but I can't hear you guys. I hope. So unfortunately, for technical reasons, I couldn't quite hear Rose and Graham at all. But I presume that they've uh, introduced me and said hello. And of course, just to let you know a little bit about what's happened in the next, uh, in the last day at RightsCon, uh, it's been amazing. Uh, for those of you who don't know, in Brussels, RightsCon is an incredible summit. More than 8,500 participants from over 150 countries, and. Hundreds of events from workshops to panels have been taking place in the last 24 hours and for the rest of the week. Uh, no surprises, a lot of the concerns uh, in Brussels are also be being discussed here, including surveillance, whether it is authoritarian surveillance, uh, but also surveillance capitalism, for example. Uh, people are also very concerned about facial recognition technology, artificial intelligence in general, uh, and so on. So it makes a lot of sense for the two organizations uh, to host this joint event. Yes, yet. Uh, but just to say that we're super excited to have this partnership as well, and all of the issues you just talked about are the same things that we're talking about here. And we're even more excited to be able to partner together to bring common programming on many of those topics themselves. I want to make sure that I don't waste any more of our time and bring on stage with us, we're very lucky to be joined by the Senior Director at the White House for Democracy and Human Rights and a special assistant to the President, Rob Bershinsky, who's going to come up and share some remarks before we get to the main event of the Secretary of State and Maria Reza. Rob. Welcome, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Hi, everybody. I feel like that was uh, kind of the equivalent of what we've all experienced in terms of giving our speech on Zoom with the, with the mute button still on. So uh, thanks. Thanks, Rose. Uh, thanks, Melissa, if you're still out there, and to uh, everybody at RightsCon. Uh, and thanks to DFR Lab for putting on uh, this session and for the opportunity to join you uh, to introduce uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and Maria Reza. It's been a real pleasure to have spent the last two days participating in discussions at the forefront of democracy and human rights. And I say that really with everyone here in mind, but particularly with respect to those truly on the front lines who have felt the impact for the struggle for human rights and democracy in deeply personal ways. These are women like Lena Al-Hathul and Kareem Kanimba, someone I had the chance to speak in depth with a couple of nights ago, and also the woman that we'll hear from shortly, Maria Reza. Before we turn to that interview, I want to take a few moments to reflect on what President Biden and so many of you, both in the room and at home, know is a key challenge of our time, demonstrating that democracy, rather than autocracy, is best poised to deliver for its citizens. In December, as I hope most in the room know, President Biden hosted 100 governmental leaders, democratic opposition figures, activists, and business and civil society leaders from around the world in what we termed the first Summit for Democracy. Both Secretary Blinken and Maria Reza spoke at the summit on a panel focused on media freedom and sustainability. And that issue alone reflects the ramifications that technology has had on the world around us. A free media is, of course, 
the bedrock of pluralistic discourse and a healthy democratic society. But in the digital age, as many of you also know, uh, has fundamentally altered the business model that has sustained and enabled independent journalism now for decades. One recent study suggests that the move to digital advertising alone eliminated nearly $24 billion in annual advertising revenue for public interest media between 2017 and last year, 2021. The economic vulnerability of media has resulted in its capture and closure around the world. And this trend has, of course, been further compounded by governments who seek to silence critical voices through internet shutdowns, censorship, digital harassment, and political and regulatory pressure that incentivizes acquiescence or leads to media capture. At the same time, digital technologies have enabled individuals, groups, and governments to create, disseminate, and amplify manipulated information for their own political, ideological, and commercial interests. So now we're at a point in time where the costs of producing high quality journalism are high, while the costs of disseminating false information and silencing critical voices, like the one we'll hear from shortly, are relatively low. And communities around the world are being impacted by this every day, not least in the United States, where an estimated quarter of newspapers have closed in just the last 15 years. And that means fewer local, trusted voices informing our debate. So all of us joining in the 360 OS and, and in RightsCon are keenly aware of the human rights impacts of this and other technology-enabled challenges. And while this could be a moment of despair, the breadth of debate, discussion, and participation at events like this reflects another new trend, one where governments and activists and companies are increasingly working together, trying to break down their silos to productively design for and mitigate the risks from new technologies. And we know authoritarian governments and other actors will continue to develop and abuse technologies for their own political and financial benefit. We know they seek to rewrite the rules of the international system and the norms that govern technology. So that's why the Biden administration is driving an agenda in which critical and emerging technologies work for and not against democratic societies. To give one example, two months ago, the United States launched with 60 of our partners around the world the Declaration for the Future of the Internet. It's a political commitment among declaration partners to advance a positive vision for the internet and digital technologies. We're backing our political commitment with expanded investments to support internet freedom, as well as digital safety and security for targeted groups while improving cybersecurity. And in parallel, under the auspices of the Summit for Democracy, we've launched hundreds of millions of new dollars in programming to expand our support for free and independent media, to fight corruption, to bolster democratic reformers, and defend free and fair election processes. And in the wake of Russia's aggression against Ukraine, we further expanded our investments in Europe and Eurasia in, in these thematic areas. We're also working to more effectively hold to account those who abuse technology to unlawfully surveil and harass human rights defenders journalists, and opposition leaders, just as Melissa was uh, mentioning in the intro in terms of the discussion at RightsCon. Yesterday, panelists stood on this stage and detailed harrowing accounts of being targeted via commercial spyware technology, among other forms of what we in the US government are increasingly referring to as transnational repression. The United States views the unlawful or inappropriate use of this technology as a national security issue. So in October of last year, we updated our export control rules governing items that can be used for malicious cyber activities. And then in November, we added four foreign companies, including but not limited to NSO Group, to the Department of Commerce's entity list, based on evidence that these firms developed and supplied spyware to foreign governments that then used the tools provided to maliciously target government officials, journalists, business people, activists, and embassy workers. And we intend to do much more in this space using all the tools at our disposal. At the same time, 
We're placing renewed emphasis on supporting multi-stakeholder initiatives, like the Freedom Online Coalition and the OSCD's work on reinforcing democracy. Just over one year ago, we joined the Christchurch call to eliminate terrorist and violent extremist content online. And then in November, we announced our support for the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace. And we're working also with key allies and partners on new initiatives, like the Global Partnership to, for Action to End Online Harassment and Abuse, and as those in, here in Brussels know well, the US-EU Trade and Technology Council. Yet we know that no single commitment, program, or action is going to resolve all of the challenges that we've been discussing over the course of the last few days and that we'll hear momentarily from the U.S. Secretary of State. Russia's aggression in Ukraine underscores the importance of taking a holistic approach to continuing threats to democracy, diplomatically, militarily, economically, and in the information realm. But by working together, by doing exactly what all of you are here doing today, Governments, advocates, researchers, and the private sector together across disciplines, regions, and responsibilities, we can and we are driving change that's going to prove to be asymmetrically advantageous for democracies. We're pursuing efforts to close the gap in digital access and driving innovation in ways that are going to foster inclusion, equity, and accountability, and support human rights rather than undermining them. So momentarily, Secretary Blinken will provide more on the breadth of efforts that the U.S. is taking to advance this agenda in his interview with Maria Reza. Maria and her team at Rappler and so many other journalists, human rights defenders, and activists, including many of you here in Brussels and online, have demonstrated courage and commitment against a global tide of democratic backsliding. So with that, I'm very pleased to announce a woman who epitomizes courage and conviction Nobel Peace Prize winning journalist Maria Reza in conversation with the U.S. Secretary of State, Tony Blinken. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Maria Reza. From Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Maria Reza from the Philippines. What an honor to have U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken with us today at a crucial moment for all of us working Ah, for a better digital rights world. Secretary Blinken, thank you for joining us. Maria, great to be with you and great to be with everyone. Um, this is uh, really a pleasure for me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be uh, hosted by uh, RightsCon to be talking to you. I wanna say greetings to everyone uh, from the uh, 360 uh, Open Summit and from around the world uh, who is in one way or another um, logged on, tuned in uh, and joining this conversation. Um, you know, it's so important from our perspective that the United States, like-minded governments, uh, but especially with civil society, uh, with NGOs, with think tanks, with the private sector, um, work to protect human rights online, uh, work to demonstrate that um, our democracies can deliver for people as we navigate this extraordinary digital transformation that is having an impact on the lives of virtually everyone uh, on this planet. One thing I wanted to say at the outset before we get into a, a conversation is, I am very pleased to announce that for the first time, uh, the United States will become chair of the Freedom Online Coalition um, in, uh, in 2023. Uh, we wanna strengthen the coalition. We wanna bring uh, more members on board. Uh, we wanna make it a center of action uh, for ensuring um, a free and open digital future. Um, and this in part is gonna be building on Canada's terrific work as the current chair and, and uh, really trying to carry it forward. So I'm really pleased to do that, uh, to be able to announce that. And Maria, it's great to be with you. Um, you have been, you are an extraordinarily uh, courageous champion of um, freedom of speech, freedom of the pre uh, of press and media and freedom uh, for a, um, a digital future that we all want uh, and uh, we hope to build together. So thank you for being uh, willing to have this conversation today. Well, you know, that that's really great to hear from you, Mr. Secretary, pre pre exactly at this moment in time when, you know, there, it, it seems at times hopeless and you never want to be hopeless, right? So let, let me ask you, you, you've been very outspoken about the, the way digital authoritarians have used tech to abuse human rights, you know, a growing trend that people like us on the front lines increasingly 
defenseless? I mean, what have you seen globally and, and what can you do about it? So you're right. Unfortunately, that's exactly what we're seeing. Look, I think uh, as in so many ways, when we saw the emergence of a lot of this technology starting mostly in the 1990s, the early 2000s, I think there was great hope uh, that it would be uh, inexorably a force for openness, transparency, freedom. And of course, in many ways it is, but we're also seeing, of course, the abuse of this technology in, in, in various ways, including by repressive governments trying to control populations, to stifle dissent, uh, to surveil and censor. Uh, we see that, of course, in, um, uh, in the PRC uh, with uh, technology being used, for example, for mass surveillance, including uh, of the, uh, the Uyghurs and other minorities. So the question is, what is to be done? Uh, what do we do about it? And there are a number of things that we need to do, and in fact, that we are doing. One is to start by calling things out. Uh, that's the often the basis for everything. We have to call out the abuse of technology, uh, including digital authoritarianism. Um, second, as I mentioned, uh, we're gonna be taking on the chairmanship of the Freedom Online Coalition. We're working to strengthen it. And this is an important vehicle to try to protect and advance internet freedom uh, and to push back against digital authoritarianism. Um, very practically speaking, there are a number of things that we, uh, countries, NGOs, and others are doing to, for example, get anti-censorship technology into the hands of uh, people who need it so that they have the tools to push back against the misuse of technology uh, in an authoritarian way. Uh, we set up a multinational fund uh, to do that uh, at the Summit for Democracy that we hosted last year. Uh, and then, for example, putting export controls on surveillance technology to make sure that technology that we and other countries are producing that could have a dual use and be misused uh, for the surveillance of populations, that doesn't get into the wrong hands. That takes working together. Uh, one country alone can't do it. Uh, and in fact, governments alone can't uh, effectively do it. We need to build these coalitions to make sure that we identify uh, where technology should not go because it's being misused and then work to, uh, together to make sure that it doesn't get there. No, that I, I agree with working together. Mr. Secretary, you know that early on I said that uh, the tech platforms that took control uh, became the gatekeepers from journalists, abdicated responsibility mm. for protecting the public sphere. And in some ways, it's taken so long to get government regulations that in a way, governments have also abdicated responsibility. We're mm. just starting to see the beginning of these rollout in the spring from the EU, right? And, and yet we know the impact of disinformation. Um, in the Philippines, we have seen disinformation repeatedly change our history. It's that Milan Kundera mm. quote, you know, the struggle of man against power. Well, we've forgotten really quickly. And disinformation is being used to manipulate our biology. Uh, where do you see what can you do about this? And how do we fight back, given that there are more than 30 elections this year mm. and you can't have integrity of elections? if you don't have integrity of facts. Hmm. Couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, this has been one of the other changes that we thought was going to be totally for the good. Uh, but of course, that hasn't been the case. In the United States, a few decades ago, uh, information that uh, most people used on a, in their daily lives, there was a common foundation um, because there were actually uh, a fairly limited number of sources of the information that people got. We had three television networks back then. Uh, we didn't have cable. We didn't have an internet. Uh, we didn't have talk radio, et cetera, uh, et cetera. Um, and the hope, of course, was that the democratization of information uh, would be uh, a, a good thing overall. And fundamentally, I believe that's still the case. But as a result of this, as a result of this disaggregation, uh, you've lost exactly what you said, which are sort of the trusted uh, mediators uh, who um, can make sure that information to the greatest extent possible is actually backed up by the, by the facts. Um, and at the same time, the technology itself uh, has allowed uh, the abuse uh, and the spreading of misinformation and disinformation in ways that we probably didn't fully anticipate uh, or imagine. So uh, we see authoritarian governments using this. Uh, we see it, for example, right now in the uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine. We saw it in 2014 uh, when uh, Russia initially went at Ukraine and was using information as a weapon of war. So in that particular instance, and in this instance, we've actually 
reverse this on them precisely by using information, real information, uh, to call out what we uh, uh, saw them preparing uh, and, uh, and, uh, and working to do. Uh, and being able to, to do that and to bring to the world uh, everything that we were seeing about the, the planned Russian aggression and to lay out exactly the steps they were likely to take, uh, and which unfortunately they did, I think has done um, uh, a profound service to making sure that um, uh, credible information is what carries the day and uh, disinformation is, uh, is undermined. But there are a number of things that we can hear again and we are doing to combat the misuse of information. Uh, again, we start by exposing it uh, and we start, we start by sharing the information that we have. Uh, working with others, again, in a coordinated way. We have at the State Department uh, something called the Global Engagement Center, uh, which is focused intensely on uh, finding, exposing disinformation, the techniques uh, that are used by those who are propagating it, and in a, a coordinated way, working with other, other countries, um, pushing back on it and giving people the tools to do it. Um, it's critical for us that we also build the capacity of partners around the world, uh, both governments, but also uh, journalists, uh, NGOs, civil society. Um, there are a number of things that we're doing. We have initiatives to help give people fact-checking tools uh, to make sure that the information that they're, they're, they're getting actually is backed up by the facts and to show when it's not. Um, digital literacy training, which is so critical um, uh, to understanding what people are, uh, are consuming and uh, being able to separate the wheat from the chaff, the true from the misinformation and disinformation. Bolstering independent media, this is so critical. Uh, the, the single best check and balance against misinformation and disinformation is an effective independent media. And we have initiatives to do that, including uh, as appropriate uh, financing and, and other things. We see that there's a, a deliberate attack to take down um, independent media, to take down uh, NGOs that are operating in this space. So we're putting in place protections. For example, countries actually try to use legal means, or I should say legal in quotation marks, legal means uh, through lawsuits, as you know very well, uh, yes. and uh, through regulatory challenge. Well, uh, we're putting in place uh, programs, funding uh, to enable people, institutions, media organizations to actually push back on that. Um, all of these things together are um, part of what we need to do. And finally, it's so critical that we and you, this entire community, work with the platforms to find ways uh, to more effectively uh, ensure that they're not being abused and used as a means of propagating misinformation and disinformation. Of course, it's primarily uh, on the platforms themselves to take the steps necessary to push back against that. I hope very much that we can continue to do that in a collaborative fashion. and sharing the information, what we're seeing, for example, with the platforms, we've found that when we've been able to point them to malicious actors using the platforms in abusive ways, um, they've been responsive in making sure those actors can't do it. But of course, it's a moving target. And for every, um, every bad actor that you take off, uh, maybe it comes back under another guise uh, or something else pops up. So we have to be vigilant. We have to be um, relentlessly focused on this. And I hope uh, that we can do this in a cooperative, collaborative way. Well, that's certainly what we're trying to do. But what we've seen in the last, uh, you mentioned 2014 until now, right? Uh, the disinformation that splintered reality that allowed Russia to invade, to, to annex Crimea, mm. and then eight years later to invade Ukraine. Those meta narratives were seeded, the platforms were told about it, not much was done. And the question, of course, is would we be at this place mm. if more was done, right? But but I guess this is this goes to the last, the crucial question, which is. We have had impunity in the virtual world. And that impunity, you have mm -hmm. a thousand page document from the Senate that, that outlines what Russian disinformation mm -hmm. did in 2016 in the United States. Um, that impunity has filtered into the real world in, and really severed the checks and balances that are there. I guess that, and here to quote Shoshana Zuboff, where she just says, we live in one world. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have rule of law in the virtual world, 
you know, how can you have rule of law yep. in the real world? Yep. And this goes back to what is your democratic vision? I think that's what's been missing is that we don't have a democratic vision uh, for the 21st century with this technology that we have. What is it that, that you have? Yeah, uh, Maria, you're, I think you're exactly right. And first, let me say, look, we've been awoken to this challenge uh, over the last years. And I think uh, for me, it certainly started particularly in 2014 with the initial Russian aggression against Ukraine and the, uh, the use of misinformation and disinformation as uh, a weapon of war, as critical to their campaign. And then, of course, we saw the interference in our elections. And all of that has created, a, I think, a, an increasingly um, a greater consciousness of the challenge and the need to do something about it. But doing something about it starts with exactly what you said, which is advancing a positive vision, uh, an affirmative vision of what this future should look like, um, a vision of an open, free, global, uh, interoperable, uh, secure, reliable internet. One of the ways we've done that is with this declaration for the future of the internet that now some 60 countries have joined onto that actually lays out what this positive vision is. Um, we're working in concrete ways though, not just to put out the vision, but to realize it. So what are the concrete steps that, that you're taking? So much of the work that we're doing is to make sure that we and other like-minded countries uh, are at the table when so many of the rules and norms uh, that are going to uh, shape the future of the internet are being decided. Um, and we're doing that in a variety of ways. We're, we've come together with the European Union through something we've stood up called the Trade and Technology Council to make sure that we're working together uh, to advance uh, these different norms and standards. There's growing convergence between the United States and the European Union on this vision for the future. Now we put that in practice by bringing our combined weight together everywhere these rules and norms are being shaped. Um, we're making sure that we're investing in our own capacity to do that. Here at the State Department, over just six months, we stood up a new bureau for cyberspace and digital policy. Uh, we will soon have an, a, a senior envoy uh, to deal with emerging technologies to make sure that to the extent values are infused in technology, uh, there'll be liberal values, not illiberal ones. Uh, and making sure the technology is used for the good and to advance uh, democracy, not to, uh, not to undermine it. We've been working to make sure that after last year's Summit for Democracy, we make this year a year for action in terms of implementing many of the concrete um, initiatives that were announced at the summit, including some that I mentioned a short while ago in terms of supporting independent media, giving people uh, the tools they need to combat censorship, uh, making sure that journalists uh, and other organizations under siege uh, can uh, fight back and have the tools and the means to do so. Um, we, as I mentioned, uh, have uh, initiated a declaration for the future of the internet with 60 countries. Uh, so far, making sure that we're all aligned in a shared vision and trying to advance it. And finally, um, the institutions that are actually doing this work, that are deciding how all of the, the technology that we share is being used, it's usually important that uh, people who share this vision, share these values, are uh, running these institutions. There's a usually important election uh, for the, uh, the head of the... Um, International Telecommunications Union coming up. And uh, a candidate we support, Doreen Bogdan Martin, is someone uh, of vision and of value uh, who um, uh, can help advance this shared perspective that we have. Um, so it's one of, those, one of those things where probably 99.999% of people have no idea uh, what the ITU is or how important this election is, but we're very focused on it and making sure that uh, someone with a shared vision. Uh, can drive this forward. Last thing I'll say, Maria, is this. I think everyone present today um, is at the heart of this effort. Civil society, NGOs, the private sector, uh, independent media, working together, holding governments to account, uh, and then ideally all of us joining forces, when you put all that together, it's a very powerful force. And it's one that I'm convinced can carry the day in making sure that the future of technology and the future of the internet 
is one that actually advances freedom, uh, that advances democratic principles, uh, and that makes sure that um, together we can build um, uh, a future that reflects the values that, that we share. So the work that every single one of you is doing in uh, ways big and small, uh, that's what really counts. And I'm just pleased for the opportunity to spend a few minutes talking about how we see it, how we think about it, especially Maria uh, with you. So thank you. No, thank you so much, Secretary Blinken. Can I quick just throw one quick question? Of you, so you mentioned leading in. Um, Cheryl Sandberg just said that she would be leaving Meta mm -hmm. this uh, at the end of this year. Um, these are American companies that did have values that were infused into their design, and mm -hmm. again, probably not by their design, that encouraged the death of democracies mm -hmm. in many parts of the world. Um, in in Norway, just last week, I, I kind of thought the next two years will be critical mm -hmm. uh, for the survival of democracy. And there were people from Kiev, from Ukraine, uh, who, who really said that they received the most help from ordinary people. You've just asked us all to work together. Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, is there a timetable? You know, the long term, yes, education, medium term, yes, laws. In the short term, how how can we stop what Ann Applebaum called autocracy inc from taking over in this period of chaos? Maria, I think we all have to be seized with the 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 fierce urgency of now. Um and yes, many of the things that we're talking about will, will play out over time. Um, much of this is not flipping a light switch uh, or turning on or off a computer. Uh, it does take time. But if we bring to it together a sense of, a sense of urgency and a sense of determination, um, that's usually important. And if this entire community is galvanized, um, I think we can, make, we can make a real difference. But that requires day in, day out vigilance, uh, it requires day in, day out action. And I think what we'll see if we, if we, if we do it right and do it in a sustained way is you, you, you take a step and you look and it doesn't look like you've traveled very far. But my hope and expectation is that over the next few years, we will take many steps together and we'll actually recognize that we've traveled a great distance. The hard reality that we face, and it's a, it's a cliche, but it's profoundly true. Um, Technology itself isn't inherently good or bad. How it's used determines uh, whether it's uh, for the good uh, or for the bad. And if we marshal all of our forces together, I think we, ha we carry a great weight into this fight to make sure to the best of our ability uh, that technology is used for the good, uh, that it's used uh, to advance a more open, more free, more democratic world, uh, and that it's not misused and abused to undermine those basic principles. But I think we have to have exactly what you said, a real sense of urgency about that, uh, a real sense of vigilance, uh, a determination to call out misuse and abuse, the determination on the part of NGOs and civil society to hold governments and hold the private sector uh, to account. Um, and I'm, I remain optimistic that marshalling all of these forces together with that sense of urgency uh, we can make a difference and we can shape a future that is um, uh, more, uh, more open, uh, more tolerant, and uh, actually supports and defends freedom and democracy and doesn't undermine it. That's the objective. But look, we have to show all of us in different ways that we can actually deliver on this. So I recognize declarations are, are, are good, uh, calling things out are good, but what really counts is action that makes a change. Uh, action that deals with the problem. Um, none of that is easy, but we're determined to do it and we're determined to do it together. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Secretary Thanks, Blinken, Marie. good luck. Great to see bye you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Really interesting remarks. And what really struck me were Race's comments about how many democracies really aren't prepared uh, in terms of their relationship with technology in the 21st century. And frankly, the authoritarian states and corporations, many corporations, have a better vision or stronger vision, rather, uh, when it comes to how they want to leverage technology. And it's really up to activists, people to hold entities to account, uh, people who care about human rights, people participating at RightsCon, uh, to really challenge the vision pushed by authoritarian states and also 
many corporations. Otherwise, this century is going to be an authoritarian century and the 21st century should be a century for democracies. And on that note, thanks so much for joining and stay engaged.